Hi, I'm Michelle Malik and you're watching Indus Special. On Monday, the Queen of England released a statement giving the Duke and Duchess of Sussex the go-ahead to step back from their royal duties. This comes after the couple announced that after many months of reflection, they would like to, like to lead a more independent life. Amidst all the sensationalism and reactions, this does lead to a deeper matter. Can the monarchy sustain itself in a progressive and modern Britain? We discuss this story in detail. Joining us for the session is Mr. Patrick Sullivan, who's the chief executive officer of UK's think tank, Parliament Street. He joins us from London. Also joining us is Clint Jungles, who's the co-director of the Center for Cognitive Archaeology at the University of Colorado. He joins us from London, too. Thank you both for joining us and welcome to the show. Mr. S Sullivan, let me begin with you. Now, when we're talking about this couple leaving uh, their royal duties behind. We're hearing a lot of headlines about it, a lot of news stories are coming out about it, a lot of speculation. Is this really as significant as it seems to be? Both yes and no. I mean, uh, in terms of is it significant, I mean, it's certainly something that's dominating the world's media. Um, Newt Gingrich was on Fox News the other day saying that this is the best news for President Trump, because the impeachment uh, uh, is going to be given to the Senate this week, and um, and of course everybody's talking about Harry and Meghan. Uh, you you obviously had the um, events regarding Iran last week, so it does seem to be quite striking that Harry and Meghan is the topic that everybody's talking about. Um, but in reality, of whether this will change anybody's day to day life, you know, this is not an issue of war and peace. Um, and it won't have much of an impact on what people are doing. What it is doing, however, is it is allowing people just a little bit of a soap opera to talk about uh, over the water cooler uh, at work um, that just isn't too, too serious. Um, because quite a lot in the news, as, as you well know, has been right. um, on the depressing note lately. Right, Patrick, now uh, you're saying that it's not going to impact people's day-to-day -day life and you're saying that it almost provides a respite from all the seriousness, all the grave issues we've been hearing about. But is this going to significantly impact the monarchy? It already has to an impact. Uh, there's a Labour MP called Clive Lewis who briefly put his name forward to run for the Labour Party leadership in the UK, didn't get enough support to make the ballot. But uh, he did suggest having a referendum on the monarchy. This is something that's happened in Australia before. Uh, Australia voted to keep it. But um, as with the story of Pandora's box, you know, once an idea has got out into the public domain, it's very difficult to contain it again. And I think there are people, especially regarded because of all the other stuff that went on last year with Prince Andrew, that are sort of questioning whether... You know, the monarchy is uh, is fit for purpose in modern Britain. Right. And that's a question I'm going to take to Clint. Now, Clint, I'd just like to read out a statement that was released by Harry and Meghan, and they posted this on their Instagram. Uh, it's stated, after many months of reflection and internal discussions, we have chosen to make a transition this year in starting to carve out a progressive new role within this institution. What do you think this means, this progressive new role they're talking about? I think what it means is is a new relationship with the media in particular. And I mean, if you look at how much symbolic power uh, the monarchy still has, or I mean, we're having this discussion now, uh, we're gnashing our teeth globally over a 35-year-old man and his wife moving out of their grandmother's house. And the normal relationship with the media was through the sort of royal uh, rodex, I think they called it. Uh, where it was sort of a formal issuing of statements and Prince Harry and Meghan have said basically they're going to start going more towards grassroots media outlets. So I think this is an interesting step because it shows that they're aware uh, that the generational view of the monarchy is changing and mm -hmm. they're sort of changing with that uh, generational so shift as well. Right, that's a very interesting point, and I'm going to pick up on that word again, progressive. Is there a recognition of the fact that the monarchy 
is outdated to some extent, especially in the uh, British society that's constantly changing? I would, I would say, particularly for the younger generation, yes. And you can also sort of understand why the older generation or generations view the monarchy slightly differently. This is uh, coming out of World War II, the United Kingdom, England was a source of stability as they stood alone against one of the most existential threats the world's ever seen. And there's sort of memories that go back to that, that hold with the older generation. But the younger generation didn't go through World War II or the austerity afterwards. And so for them, it just seems this relic of, of an older time period where this small elite group of people are being given tax dollars and untold levels of privilege that they haven't earned. You've got a massive shift in those two generations and how they perceive the monarchy. And I think Harry and Meghan are right on sort of the leading edge of changing with the generational views. Right. Um, uh, Patrick, now, as Clint put it, that there is a symbolic value attached to the monarchy, especially for generations that saw uh, a world coming out after World War II, what it meant for this to happen. Now, we do know that... Uh, Britain is going through political turmoil at this point in time. There is a lot of upheaval. Does the monarchy still hold the same significance, symbolic significance, as it did a couple of decades ago? Well, um, um, the monarchy at the moment is the last vestige of the old hereditary system. When Tony Blair got elected uh, Prime Minister in 1997, one of the first things that he did was get rid of the hereditary peers in the House of Lords. So th 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 there's been a gradual dismantling of the idea of divine rights of kings or you know, one person handing over a title to, to their children, which would then give them a role in the government of Britain. Um, I mean, the thing is, is that the Queen, the monarch, is still the head of state in Britain but she is the only part of the British constitution which uh, sort of has any relic of that old feudal hereditary system. Glenn, now talk about this. How important is this institution for the national identity, especially for Britain? Are monarchs anywhere in the world? When we talk about their importance and we often go to their symbolic importance, how important is it for the national identity? I think in, in Britain, it's uh, particularly unique, uh, the level of importance that the monarchy holds uh, for the national identity and unity. It's sort of a living, embodied symbol of national identity, almost in the same way you could say the United States looks at the, the American flag as a symbol of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and a part of the American uh, ideals of freedom. And I think the monarchy somewhat plays that sort of a role uh, to a much greater degree than I think you'd see for most other uh, royal institutions in other countries. Right. And why do you think that is? Part of it's because so much of it can be seen in the public eye. I, so much of it is a part of uh, what you might experience as a tourist or even as a, somebody traveling to London where you can... Uh, see the Royal Guard and all the things relating to that. So there's a number of symbolic mm -hmm. institutions and icons that go along with this whole sort of complex symbol of identity that is uh, the British monarchy. Right. Patrick, now, as we've got this sense of identity and what it means to be British, there is, of course, a cost uh, that is incurred by having a monarchy, and the costs seem to be increasing. Now, there was a 41% increase in 2018 to 2019, seen from the previous year when we talk about how much the monarchy cost the public. What are the on-ground sentiments about that taxpayers' money going and uh, continuously sustaining uh, this institution? Well, I think this is... Um partially why Harry and Meghan want to become independent, uh, because when the taxpayer pays for the, the royal family, it is expected that the royal family stays out of politics, or at least party politics or having opinions. Now, uh, we know that Meghan Markle has 
um, some very progressive opinions on things such as climate change and uh, gender equality. And she wants to be more of a campaigning force. Um, she's been interested in these issues since she was very young. Uh, and we know that Harry has his own um, sort of uh, political issues and political beliefs as well. Um, that so long as they are dependent upon the British taxpayer, they are almost not allowed to have the same independence of views as any other British citizen. Uh, so I think part of their desire to be independent is their desire to have the same degree of independence of thought and independence of speech that the rest of us have. Right. With that independence, of course, you mentioned that that's actually one of the reasons. But also what it seems to be is Meghan having a very hard time adjusting in the monarchy. And that goes back to the identity question. What it means to be British, what it means to belong to the monarchy. It's been reported that she has faced racist uh, headlines in the tabloids, many different things attacking her, comparing her uh, to Kate, uh, many different things happening. Clint, on that point specifically, do you feel like the British public at large, especially those coming from the younger generations, are accepting a new form of what it means to be British? Yes, I would suggest that the younger generation is very much sort of moving into a new identity of what it really means to be British. And Harry and Meghan are sort of recognizing that. And I, I think they're trying to distance themselves from the sort of older identity uh, so they can engage more. And what that's also pretty clever in a way because no matter what, the monarchy is still going to have the attention of the world. So now they've put themselves in a position where they don't have to follow the traditional rules, but we're all still going to be paying attention to them. And so they've got a lot more freedom uh, to put out political ideas and opinions that most of the rest of the royal family won't have. Right. Uh, Rick, that same question there. Now, um, Clint seems to say that there is a changing conception of what it means to belong to the British society. The younger generation is more progressive in that. But what we've been seeing and witnessing in the news is rise in xenophobic attacks, rise in Islamophobic attacks. Do you agree with that view that the concept of what an ideal British citizen is like, what their ethnicity should be, is changing? Um, um, but the ethnicity thing uh, does have a particular impact. I, myself, I'm sort of uh, Irish-British ethnicity, so um, if you go back far enough, uh, the royals and the descendants, uh, uh, sort of the, the, their ancestors, weren't exactly two times my ancestors, to put it bluntly, um, and a number of Irish people. Uh, the idea that um, the, uh, I, the monarchy comes from this, this idea, this concept of divine right of kings, uh, and the idea that it would have to be uh, this sort of cookie-cutter Anglo-Saxon um, idea of, um, of who should rule is, is very outdated. Uh, I think there was a lot of people uh, across Britain who thought when Meghan Markle um, got engaged to, to Prince Harry that it was a breath of fresh air because you were going to get a royal family that looked a lot more like modern Britain um, rather than a royal who had married, as they traditionally used to do, within the old aristocracy. Um, you know, this is a, a, a sort of progressive, more you know, forward, forward-thinking world family, really. Clint, last question to you. Now, Queen Elizabeth II has been the longest reigning monarch of Britain, and there is a lot of speculation that with her, there will be an end to the monarchy. And with this move that we're seeing from this young couple trying to change the pattern here, trying to be more progressive, do you feel like that could be a reality, that she might be the last monarch? I actually, I don't think she will be the last monarch. I just think the role of the monarchy within the public eye and the public life will change. And I suspect uh, the way we're seeing with Harry and Meghan will be more indicative of what that will look like after her. But there's so much 
within the monarchy that's it's got a power as a symbol I, I don't think the British government and people are going to give it up they they it's got the eye of the world with the monarchy people are paying attention and it, it would almost in a way they'd be losing one aspect of their national voice if they were to completely give up the monarchy. Right. On that point, thank you so much, Clinton and Lewis, for joining us from London, and Mr. Patrick Sullivan for joining us from London. We're going to go for a short break. When we return, we discuss the state of democracies around the world and whether other forms of governance have values relevant to the modern world. Stay with us. Welcome back to the show. With political unrest and discontent around the world, are democracies delivering? And more importantly, are democracies working for everyone and can citizens look towards other forms of governance for greater stability? That's our discussion today. Joining us is Mr. Saeed Khan, who's a senior lecturer in Near East and Asian Studies and Global Studies at Wayne State University in Detroit. He joins us from Detroit. Also joining us is Professor Aristotle Callis, who's the Professor of Modern and Contemporary History at Keele University. He joins us from Edinburgh. Thank you both for joining us and welcome to the show. Mr. Khan, let me begin with you. Now, what we do want to talk about is democracy.